I mean, when I look at it, it looks to me, Constantine, as though the politicians are making it up as they go. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kissing. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our fantastic guest today is a consultant oncologist and a professor of medicine at the University of Buckingham. Professor Karen Sakura, welcome to Trigonometry. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to have you here. You, COVID-19 has obviously been a huge factor in uh, the life of this country and in fact the world in the, last, uh, in the last few months. Before we get into that, tell everybody a little bit about who are you, uh, what's been your background, how are you uh, here today? So I'm an oncologist, someone that treats cancer with chemotherapy and radiotherapy and uh, did medicine, went straight into academic medicine, oncology, and went to the States for a couple of years at Stanford. Fantastic experience in the States. Came back here and have been a consultant in the NHS for 40 years. Uh, I started young as a consultant. Now I'm very old. So I've been through the whole thing. And then, of course, COVID came out of nowhere. I'm really out of nowhere. In February, you can see it building up. I said, it's not going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. It's all back to normal by Easter. And of course, we know it wasn't back to normal. It's getting continuing now. Here we are in the autumn. The leaves are turning brown and we're still dealing with COVID daily. I said myself, it's just the flu. Uh, so I know how you feel. But um, the thing we really wanted to ask you about, there's, there's a thing that's been bothering us, and we, we exchanged some emails and we talked about this, which is that it seems like the consequences of the lockdown are not being given as much weight and attention as the consequences of the coronavirus itself. So people don't seem to be thinking about the fact that the lockdown leads to economic problems and economic problems lead to social problems, to medical problems, to health issues. And it, 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 are we right to, to feel that, that those consequences are not being properly looked at when we consider the balance of the actions that are being taken? I mean, when I look at it, it looks to me, Constantine, as though the politicians are making it up as they go. Mm. They, they don't have a long-term stra- strategy, and nor do they, their advisors. They're, there are probably too many advisors. These sage committees, we hear about 40 or 50 people. They like to get consent. If you have a committee, it wants to get consensus. I've seen it in the NHS over the years. They want consensus. So you don't really get leadership. You just get a sort of democracy of votes. And then people discuss, and then you all go down one route. And it changes. It's like a, uh, watching birds flying around in groups and swarms of birds, and they suddenly change direction, and they all go the other way. And that's what we've been seeing with this. Um, whether the decisions at different time points are going to prove the correct ones, you won't really ever know. I mean, the, you, you summarized it well. There's the, the health, there's the econo- economy, but there's also COVID versus other health. And that's sort of been forgotten about. And, you know, I, that, that was the reason that I joined Twitter to try and point out, look, hey, we can't stop everything. We can't stop cancer being treated. And not only that, we can't stop the diagnostic process for cancer. So uh, what's really important is to think of it, COVID is one box, other health is another box. And that if you spend a lot of time on COVID, you won't have the other box for other specialties, and not just cancer, but heart disease, mental health, all these things. And then at the other end, you've got the economy, which loops around back into health yeah. because social dis- destruction, the fabric, unemployment, mental health, poverty, deprivation, child abuse, they're all connected in that. It's not, they're not isolated. And so ruin the economy and you'll get different health problems. And Carol, we, we, we've been talking about COVID and at the, at the start, there was a, the stat of half a million people are going to die if we don't do something. How dangerous is it as a disease? Is it, as some people say, that it's for most people it's absolutely fine? Do you risk long-term complications if you get it? How virulent is it? That is the great puzzle, Francis. So if you take the cruise ships, they were the best studied. Uh, The cruise ship, and there was an aircraft carrier, uh, uh, a French aircraft carrier and an American battleship, all got infected. Roughly the same statistics. Uh, high levels of infection, thousands of people on the ships got infected, very few people died. And the cruise ship that was stuck in Yokohama Harbor, if you remember, in April of this year, 
it was a luxury cruise ship, and the average age of the, the customers was 72. So these are old people, and yet there were very few deaths, something like 10 deaths altogether out of 700 people infected. Not only that, you've got people that get infected, clearly, when they have a, a PCR test, or the virus is present, the virus genomic material is present, and yet they've got no symptoms at all, no fever, no shortness of breath, nothing, no loss of smell. And, and taste, which are the key features of COVID. And yet they've definitely been infected. So it's a huge puzzle. And the real problem for public health, normally you go chasing the disease. So if you take cholera, you look for people with diarrhea, you isolate them, you make the family wash their hands, you go to the source of where they're eating from, the drinking from, and try and see what, where the cholera was coming from. They're ill before they get the infection and then they become ill. With this, you get infected and you don't become ill in many cases. So it's very difficult to go tracing it. And so you do have to have in fact, a, a, a good test for the disease. What we've seen just this morning, Matt Hancock has announced that he's gonna enlarge the testing program. You know, this should have been done you know, three months ago. You really want to find out where it is. But we do seem things have changed. I mean, they've definitely changed since we started in April. Um, the peak was obviously March, then peaked in April in terms of if severity of disease. Now people are not going to hospital, and it's a slightly younger age group that's being infected. But we're testing everybody. The more you test, the more you find. And so, especially if you target your testing. So if you go to hospitals, you go to Leicester, you go to Oldham, Rotherham, and places like that, knock on doors, shove sticks up people's noses, <laughs> they're much more likely to be positive. You know? yeah. Now, and also, if we convert to saliva testing, we just tested all our staff with saliva testing just yesterday for the first time. That is a, a, such an easy way of doing it because it's not at all intrusive. It doesn't have any uh, ethical issues. Uh, you know, people don't like having the stick up their nose and it, mm. it requires someone, you don't have to have much skill to do it, but you, you have to be able to do it. And uh, the other risks of sticking sticks up people's noses, they splutter at you. And if mm. they're infected and they're spluttering, this is not good for you. So you have to wear some sort of protective clothing and that looks frightening, especially for children. So collecting a piece of a sample of spit into a tube is a lot less invasive, basically. And uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask is, obviously, as we ramp up the testing, one of the things we are doing is uncovering lots of people, as you say, who have been infected, who we weren't aware of before. Is, is, is one of the consequences of that not an indication that this disease is a lot less lethal than we thought? Absolutely. And the fact you know, hospitalization is a key to death because if you don't get admitted to hospital, you're unlikely to die. That's usually how, I'm sure, there have been deaths at home and in care homes and so on, but most people that die go to a hospital. Most people not only go to a hospital, the ones that are going to die go to intensive care and then they die. So that's the pathway. So if no one's going into hospital, that means something's different. There are several explanations for that. The nice explanation, which I'd like, is that the virus wants to be kind to us. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like medically verifiable. It's got a little white flag, you yeah. know. It's yeah. waving a little on the end of those little spikes that yeah. you can see in the kids' diagrams. You've got a little white flag saying, I want to be friend. But evolutionary-wise, that's not a bad strategy for the virus. That means it will stay with us forever. Now, we may not like the sound of that, but, you know, the common cold virus is staying with us forever, and we've adapted to it. The flu virus is staying with us, and we've adapted. Why not coronavirus 2? A coronavirus 1, which is the SARS virus, way back from 2003, 17 years ago, uh, it's still around, uh, even though it doesn't trouble society. And that's the great puzzle, how these viruses can insert themselves into us. You know, I tried to involve a philosopher uh, at Oxford on the philosophy of why does the virus exist? He wasn't too interested. <laughs> he said, no, no, it's not. And you know, does the virus have a soul? Can it tell between good and evil and all this sort of stuff? Of course not. It's a little bag. It's the simplest form of life. Um, well, and it, even whether it's alive or dead is contentious. I think it's alive. It, it borrows life. It's, on its own, it doesn't do anything. It's in a bunch of chemicals. Once it gets into a cell, it hijacks living processes that we have to become alive, basically. And then it comes out again and reverts to being dead. Just I know people like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> you're talking about me. Uh, but, uh, but Carol, uh, just so the, the, 
for, just for people watching at home uh, who are not medical experts, yeah. compared to, let's say, the common, the flu, which kills a lot of people, as, as we now discover. <laughs> Most medical professionals, of course, would have known that anyway, but yeah. ordinary people don't think of the flu as this great killer. But it does kill a lot, particularly old and vulnerable people every winter, especially. Compared to the flu, the coronavirus as it is now, is it more lethal, less lethal, about the same? Do we have any sort of idea about that? It's about the same. And that's the problem with it all. You know, and uh, the other thing we haven't come to yet is vaccination. Yes. We have a vaccine for the flu, but it's never very good. No. It's 50% effective. And we make a lot of fuss. Some people have it, some people don't. Uh, and uh, you know, if you're over 60, you get it free. If you're a healthcare professional, you get it free. Uh, and uh, if you're vulnerable as a young person, if you're your young age, you'd also get it free. But uh, we forget that the flu kills more people than this has killed this year. And it doesn't, but it doesn't happen in quite the same way. The other similarity is the age difference. The, you know, it, the flu, like COVID too, is a, an age related. The average age of someone that's died this year with COVID is 82. So that's the average age. 82? 82, exactly. It's the same with flu. Younger people, 70-year-olds, um, they get over it. It's people with bad lungs, previous infections that die from flu in hospital and that don't respond to the antibiotics, basically. It happens every winter, and we accept that. Flu is winter related. That's one of the big differences. COVID is not. It seems to go just even throughout the year. So as we go into winter now, the biggest worry is that we get a second wave. I don't believe there will be, but it's just imagine you get a big spike of uh, infection around the country. At the same time, you get the flu. And so you get people with chest infections. You can't tell the difference. You've got older people, some with COVID, some with pneumonia because of the flu, and you'll start with a whole lot of patients and the NHS shuts down, and that's the, uh, the disaster. Uh, and there was a very gloomy prediction report from SAGE two weeks ago, predicting 85,000 deaths in the second wave and uh, moving into winter pressures. And, you know, the, the top echelons of the NHS um, they have to plan for that sort of scenario. You have to plan for it, which would involve closing down cancer and everything again. Uh, it would also mean for society closing down a lot of other things, schools, shops, pubs, the, the rest of it. And of course, that would have huge economic disaster if we had to shut down again. So I think you know that's the disaster scenario, which epidemiologists like, by the way, from Ferguson downwards. Ferguson was the half a million deaths predictor at the beginning. And so Neil Ferguson uh, and his colleagues... He was slightly distracted <laughs> when he was working on it, as they, we now know. Their, their importance depends on how gloomy they can be. Because right. if, if a politician hears he's going to have half a million deaths to answer for, he's going to wake up and say, OK, Come in here, tell me what I have to do. If he says, no, nah, it'll blow over, there'll only be 40,000, it'll all blow over, and they'll all be 82 and above anyway, and you know, all this sort of thing. Apologies, says, well, that's not too bad, we'll just ride with it. So it's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, and uh, I've noticed the, the epidemiologists love it. They, 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 they phrase the whole thing. This is not a prediction, this just could happen. And I remember seeing a very funny, well, a funny cartoon where you know, it's got four boxes, and the first box is, um, you know, predict gloom. Uh, I'm wrong. They, they cheer. They say, I, I, I saved you from the gloomy prognosis. <laughs> if it happens, I've told you so. That, that's what happens. If you predict no gloom, it's all going to be okay, and it goes bad, you're fired. You mm. know? So uh, what can an epidemiologist do? They're just body counters, basically. So... It's, it's a very strange scenario. So the doctors, the actual treatment doctors like me, say, come on, you, you can't do that. You've got to be more realistic. And otherwise, the implication of gloomy epidemiology is you shut things down. You build Nightingale hospitals, completely wasteful in terms of money and not thought. So obviously, we'll talk about the second wave potentially and the second lockdown. But let me just get something clear in my head, because I have a confusion that I know from listening to our viewers is shared by many people, which is this. We were told that the first lockdown, the purpose of the first lockdown was protect the NHS, 
crush the sombrero or whatever Boris Johnson said, right? And it's about preventing the NHS from being overwhelmed. We achieved that overwhelmingly. The NHS is not overwhelmed. The Nightingale hospitals, which you just mentioned, uh, were essentially unused, saw almost no patients. Uh, at the moment, uh, the numbers of people in hospital, as you say, are very, very low. And yet we continue to have what you might describe as quite restrictive measures of people wearing masks indoors, uh, social distancing, there's certain things that you can't do, et cetera, et cetera. If the rationale for, the, for all of these measures was to protect the NHS, why are we still doing all of this stuff? No, uh, it, it was to start with, there's no doubt. Before Easter, Easter was about the 8th of April. Mm. And uh, as we came up, the worry was what happened to Italy, the, the, the health service nearly got overwhelmed. It sort of, it was overwhelmed. There was prioritization of younger versus older people in intensive care and so on. We never got overwhelmed here. There was one hospital declared a, an emergency in, in Northwest London, Northwick Park Hospital. And that's just a redistribution. Too many people pitched up in the emergency room at the same time. You know, it's easy to solve. You just go somewhere else. You take them in ambulances somewhere else. And so that was solved. The problem we've got is that the problem then was you couldn't predict what was going to happen. And so, and the logo, the, 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 the strap line of, uh, you know, s s s protect the NHS, save lives, stay home, uh, was the line that frightened everybody. That was the line to keep people. And, you know, older people especially were doing it because they thought they were protecting other people, protect the NHS, mm. which implies protect them. And of course, cancer patients didn't come forward. During that period of April and May, 45% reduction in the number of people having heart attacks. Now, it can't be that it was a 45% reduction. <laughs> it just meant no one came because they suffered chest pain and didn't do anything about it. The attendance, the emergency room, if anything, was dropped to 50% of what it normally is. That's because people weren't going out on Saturday yeah. night. That's yeah, why. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they didn't want to get out there. Yeah. They didn't go have knife fights yeah. and drug deals yeah, and the exactly. car But so as, as you move forward, uh, now it's about trying to protect the whole system from uh, winter pressures coming because the same measures of social distancing, hand washing, mask wearing protect you from other infections like flu. So it, it's a bit of both now. The real truth, Constantine, is we, nobody knows what's going to happen. Neither me as an oncologist and not the epidemiologist, nor the, my infectious disease colleagues. They really don't know what's going to happen. And to me, there are really three options now the virus has got. It can fizzle out, which is the great option. We all want a fizzler here. Mm. We want it just to go weak and learn to live with us, and we'll just cope with it, and that's fine. The second option it has is local spike, and that's what we're seeing, which are politically quite damaging because, you know, you get this rivalry in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and trying to show that they're coping better and so on. And, you, you know, when we do see a local outbreak, it's not like we're really doing that drastic measures. We may make confusing rules. You can't socially go and visit grandma, but you can go to a pub with grandma mm. and have a meal in the pub. So this is, makes no sense. No. And what you really have to do, if you really believe in, in, in public health strategy, you have to shut the town down. You have to cut off the roads, put roadblocks around it, Close the railway station, so that's it. That's what we did in Russia. <laughs> yeah. I'm from Russia. That's what I, we is that way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's what, and what they did in Italy. Yeah. It's yeah. the police roadblocks everywhere. You yeah. couldn't go from north to south in Italy. Yeah. So no, you go back. Uh, and we, we haven't done that anywhere. Mm. In Oldham or all these other places, all the Manchester suburbs that are hot. So uh, the third thing for the virus is the full-blown second wave. When it really comes back, a higher peak that you can't squash with hospital admissions, intensive care, flooding the system. Now, it, it's clear that nobody really believes that third option is going to happen. And it probably is between the two, fizzling out with a few local spikes. And we can cope with that. And it's the same pattern around Europe. The difficulty is how serious you have to take things. Like, you know, the beginning of this week, I uh, remember seeing the, the story about the Zanchi and the Chewy flight that came from Zanchi to, uh, to, Covent, to, to Cardiff. 
and 11 people were infected on it, testing positive. What do you do about that? Do you suddenly close down Greece? Do you make quarantine for everybody? It's, it's very difficult. There's no right or wrong answer. My own feeling is you just ignore it and you just leave it. Carol, what I'm getting at, and I think this is a question in a lot of people's minds, is you've said that the average age of death for a, a patient, a COVID patient in this country is 82. We had a period which was the summer and late spring yeah. when the NHS was not overwhelmed. Are we not overreacting with everything that, that we are being forced to do, particularly given that there's a cost to the reaction? Yeah. The, the cancer people who are not coming in to get a diagnosis, the heart attacks that are going untreated, mental health, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, child abuse, all of these things yeah. are exacerbated by people being forced to isolate. There's a lack of communication between different generations. All of these things cause a problem. Have we not overreacted? I think we have. And I think we've, if you if taking it as a doctor, we've certainly overreacted, in putting too much emphasis in healthcare on COVID and removing it from the other things. In terms of the economy, I think we've already discussed the fact that economy and health are intertwined. You mm. can't separate the two. And if the economy goes down the tubes, then even people that are currently in deprivation areas are going to be worse, worse off. They're not going to be healthier. They're not going to be... Carol- there's a question that I really wanted to ask you. So you're, you're an oncologist, you're a cancer specialist. What effect has this had on people having cancer treatments, people being diagnosed with cancer? What are the real world implications of this? So for people with cancer that we've known at the beginning, say you had cancer in April, has it really impacted? We've tried to minimize the impact. So if you're on chemotherapy or radiotherapy, you got it. If you're about to have surgery, except in the period in March and early April, most people got it. The biggest impact, which is still ongoing, is on people that have got symptoms, they've gone to the doctor, and they haven't really been get, got into a diagnostic pathway. So the, you only diagnose cancer by taking a little bit of tissue, called biopsy, from wherever the cancer is, and the four common areas, breast, lung, prostate, and colon. So you've got to get in there which means doing some technique, some image, ultrasound, CT scan, MR scan. And there's been a complete shutdown of all the diagnostic pathways for far too long now. The first three months you could perhaps excuse, but some of them are still not operating as normal. One estimate last week suggests that 15 million people were actually waiting for a diagnostic test. The problem is a lot of people have diagnostic tests and only a small proportion, thank goodness, have cancer, but we don't know which they are in there. So um, if you take CT scans, you screen maybe 100 people and only 12 or 13 will actually have cancer in there, but there's no way of prioritizing them. That's a, We've tried to fast track people with cancer-like symptoms, but it's not like that. The other problem for the NHS, which is peculiar to this country, is that it's undercapacitized anyway for diagnostic tests. So in France, if you need a CT scan because you've got a cough or you've coughed up a bit of blood, you'll get it by next week. It'll all be sorted out by next week. Here, you may take three months. And that's normally, that was 2019 before all this happened. And so now, because of the huge backlog, if you have cancer but don't know it, it's going to take longer to diagnose. And the danger in that is it gives cancer the opportunity to spread. And whilst we're very good at treating localized cancer in the four main organs, but anywhere else you have it, we're not so good if the disease starts spreading. The outcome, the prognosis goes down and the treatment gets more difficult, more arduous for the patient. So chemotherapy, radiotherapy, immunotherapy, all these things which we can do, but the prognosis is much worse if the cancer spreads out to the primary organ. And so that's the impact of this. Five published papers in the UK looking at trying to quantitate that impact. And they vary from 20,000 excess deaths because of the delay to 50,000 excess deaths already. And that's the, the worrying feature. And we're still not back to normal. Uh, again, the, the, our health minister said we were nearly back to normal. I would dispute that. If there are 15 million people waiting, but this is not normal, even in the NHS. Uh, you know, there aren't 15, 15 million people in France waiting for a diagnostic. We've got to, we've really got to speed that whole thing up. And the other thing, of course, it's not just the big diseases. We've, there's all sorts of other diseases that we need to look at. 
I mean, people, children with deafness, they've just been ignored. People with, uh, you know, things that are, we say, well, they can just wait, just put it on hold. Mm. Uh, deaf children, for example, that need hearing assessment, people with uh, painful hips, painful knees, not urgent because they've had pain for years, they need a hip replacement, just, they'll just have to wait. And the waiting list at the best of times is uh, often more than a year anyway. Now, it's, it, it's going to be two or three years before they get the, the NHS to get them the operations. So a lot of pain and suffering is caused by the virus, not directly, but the indirect effects on our health service. But the, the number that I found staggering there is you said there are between 20 to 50,000 excess deaths as a result of the virus purely from cancer. Is that correct? That's correct. Why is this not a bigger scandal? I know. <laughs> I keep saying everybody. It is a scandal. And, you know, the, the, the reason it's such a variance, that 20, how can you not know whether it's 20,000 at one end or 50,000? Mm. And the reason is the only way to know will be next year when we look back on it or you'll be able to look and see how the cancers behave. Yeah. Uh, we can't do it now. We can make predictions and all these things are predictions for delay. So if the delay is only one month, it's not going to make that much difference. If it's six months, that'll be the other end. That'll be the 50,000 end. And the 20,000 is about four months delay. Uh, altogether, the, the, the mass of cancer in this country is very simple. There are 360,000 new patients a year. That's 30,000 a month. And uh, that means a thousand a day. At the moment, the cancer diagnostic rate is running at about half of that. So it's running at about 500 a day. So it's not that the other 500 aren't getting cancer, that COVID has suddenly prevented cancer and everyone's been uh, not getting it. It's just hide the, it's, it's hiding the fact that these people haven't been able to get the diagnostic necessary to, to work. So half the people who yeah. need to be tested for cancer are not getting and they're tested. Not being, well, they're in the queue. Yeah, but they have, they're not exactly. getting it now. Uh, yeah. They're not there now, and they don't know it, of course. So that's the, so certain things have picked up. So mammography, which are breasts, yeah. Yeah. that's really picked up. And because it's simple, it doesn't generate any uh, aerosol, there's no touching involved necessarily, so it can be done. That your, your flow of patients isn't affected by it. At the other end, you've got endoscopy, which involves putting a tube down in the mouth or into the back passage, but down into the mouth, people are going to cough and splutter. It generates aerosol. You've got to wear full protective clothing for the operator. You've got to clean everything between each patient, disinfect the whole place. So instead of doing 10 endoscopies a morning, for example, which would be the average endoscopy list, you're down to three or four a morning. So, And yet you've got a backlog. For, for, for four or five months backlog. So it's very difficult, the slow pace. What's the solution? Well, you just have to work harder, work longer, and do what it takes and, uh, and change the processes. You know, industry, a pub, let's change the way it works. It wants the revenue. Um, you know, I'm a little bit, uh, and uh, the public, private, private sector is much more efficient going to change. Public sector has the luxury of time and the luxury of well, there's no incentive to do anything. We can discuss the problem, set up a committee, do a working party, write a few papers. A piece of work is a paper in the NHS. It's not actually doing anything. And uh, once you've got that, uh, you know, what you need, you, it's difficult to get rid of the backlog. Plus the fact the staff feel, uh, you know, during the whole COVID thing, there was a lot of effort and it was sort of, I hate to say it, but it was it was fun. It was different from normal. People pulled together. It was mm. a great spirit. And they were recognized by the public and all the, the heroes, the banging of spoons, all that stuff. Great. That's all gone. And so now people are beginning to complain. They've been on a list. They've been told to come back next month and nothing's happening. GPs, uh, you know, the problem there is a lot of GPs just shut up shop. I mean, they don't like me when I say this, but it's true. I'll, some work through, and, but when you look, we have a health service that's primary care based. Why didn't they take control of the whole pandemic in reality? All the testing should be done in GP surgeries. It should be done in the car parks of GP surgeries. I mean, why should people go up to Aberdeen if you live in Sussex for a test to have a swab put in your nose when there's a perfect network of primary care doctors, nurses, healthcare technicians in these places. So I think that's that's probably what we have to get back to. Um, and why is it that it's now taboo to criticise lockdown, to criticise the government's handling of it, 
to even say that maybe our reaction was overblown, especially when the, there's numbers of the excess deaths that you've just quoted. I mean, if we were in a dictatorial state, we'd all be arrested. They'd be breaking the doors down. The Polizei, <laughs> the Stasi would be at the gates out there and breaking you down. But but you say that. So there's a footage of this pregnant woman being arrested in Australia. For a I know. I, I've seen it. I, I think that's the over, over abuse of, of power. And I think that's... On the whole, in Britain, we've handled it very... I, I must say, I think the police have handled it as well as they could. You know, mm. We've not... If there was good footage, it would certainly be on mainstream media, and we haven't seen it. Yeah. And uh, and you know, a few people got arrested. If you know, you know people in, in in with raves and so on, no one's too sympathetic about that. Mm. What you do object to is, you know, there was one I saw something right at the beginning when we were in proper lockdown. Some little old lady was made to open a shopping bag at a police checkpoint to see if she'd really been shopping. I mean, that just seems ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. If you allow people to go shopping, you just have to assume they're going to take their own responsibility where they've really been shopping mm. or gone to visit someone. It's it's not policeable, this whole thing. And I think that's the that is an abuse of power. And I'm sure um you know, reading about a police that broke up a, a child's birthday party yes. somewhere. I mean, this is just not what police want to do. You imagine your you know, hands up, you're surrounded. <laughs> <laughs> we've got tear gas wagons, we've got water cannon, we're going to yeah. bust up your party. You know, <laughs> some little five year old girl in tears. You know. This is not how we handle it here. And on the whole, it's been handled really well, I think. The difficulty is that the politicians maybe get a kick out of power. I mean, it's, a, it's the taste of power you don't normally have. Emergency regulations always give people more power than they. Public health guys, the same. You imagine some overzealous, uh, overzealous public health inspector in, in a council. His moment of glory, you can come put a black cross on your door, and mm -hmm. that's it. You're finished. Mm. You're, you know, even yesterday at the hospital, I was going around the Stoke Mandeville Hospital. And uh, I was not wearing my mask properly. This is a confession. Mm. I don't normally make confessions on TV, but I'm telling mm -hmm. you. And it was just after the, my nose was visible. And it was this uh, very nice uh, lady, a nurse in a sister's uniform, came and showed me her card, infection control nurse. I said, yes, your mask is not on your nose. I had to put it back. I said, Thank you. And she walked off. I thought, brilliant. Imagine if she could get, uh, you know, you are surrounded, put your mask on, or you'll be arrested. Yeah. Well, you see, you, we joke about it, but sometimes in my more paranoid moments, I think, are we going to, are we, are we going to arrive at that point? No, I think we're going to get out of it before we get there. Now, that, well, let's talk about that, Carl, because right. you've said repeatedly that uh, you don't think there's going to be a second wave. Isn't, isn't there some evidence that this is a sort of seasonal disease that is likely to make a comeback? Or have all the people who are going to sort of get it and die from it already got it and died from it? Well, all the, the two things are, are the main bulk of vulnerable people already suffered and gone? But that's one thing. And the second thing is the virus changing to be more amenable to live with us and not to cause severe infection. Uh, and cause the lung damage that results in death of via intensive care units and so on. So uh, we really just don't know. And time will tell. The next few weeks are critical. As we increase testing and as we increase risk, schools going back does increase the risk. But, you know, it's the first week's too early to tell. We'll know by the end of next week how many schools have had to shut because of it. Hopefully none. And then as we go forward, as more and more offices open, especially in London, we'll see. If you look at the last few weeks, London's become, if you just take London, because that's where we are now, but I'm sure it's the same for all major cities, um, it, it's opened up and we've not seen any change. I mean, nothing's happened, basically. Certainly the emergency rooms are empty, which is the best indicator of severe disease. So I think we're going to go forward with that. Now, we've kept mentioning, we may as well talk about it now, I guess, the second wave concept. Mm, yes. The second wave comes from influenza, where the, we were talking about Spanish flu. It wasn't in Spain, really. It was in France and Germany and Britain, but it's called Spanish because Spain was a neutral country in the First World War. And therefore, 
and the, the, the military and the censorship in the countries at war meant they couldn't talk about their military strength being wiped out by mm. flu. Mm. Uh, more people died of flu in the First World War. More servicemen died of flu in the First World War than by enemy action, which is amazing. I only learned that mm. relatively recently. So when we move forward with the Spanish flu, the first wave killed about 5 million people and the second wave 50 million. People. So that was just massive, which if you remember, well, you don't remember, nor do I. <laughs> <laughs> the, the population of the world is a fraction of what it is yes. now. Mm. So the, the 50 million people in 1918 is a massive percentage of the total population. If you take the age group, it was tragic. And, and so uh, that, the second wave, then there was a third and fourth wave. And it, it's to do with the fact that winter came along and because flu is a winter disease, that just produced the right conditions for the flu. This isn't 1918. We've got better technology. Uh, we've got antibiotics now, which they didn't have then. And of course, it's COVID, COVID, COVID-2, which isn't seasonal on the whole. It's, it's constant throughout. So we're not so worried about it in winter. We are worried about, of course, getting overwhelmed by winter pressures, which is mm. due to flu, coming at the same time if we can't get rid of the COVID-2. If you look at countries that are a little bit further along, so there, was, there are three countries that opened up at mid-April, 14th of April, and that was Austria, Czech Republic, and, and, and Denmark. They all opened at that time. When I say open, they opened schools, they opened pubs, restaurants, all these mm-hmm. things. And we look at what's happened there. It's, there has been a rise, but rather like here, it's a slow rise and it's now coming down again. And the predictors is that they've got away with it without a, certainly no second wave in hospitalization, which is the key thing. That's all that matters uh, in reality, especially if the rise is due to better testing and more frequent testing, mm. picking up people. Can I put to you a hypothetical, and it will take some time to sort of set out, but we've said that the initial lockdown that we've had and the other responses were a bit of an overreaction, I think that's yeah. fair to say. If there is, contrary to your predictions, which we believe, but, but if, if, you, if you're not right, and there is a second wave, what would be the appropriate response to that, given everything that we've yeah. talked about with Francis, where it's hard to say what's done more damage, COVID or the lockdown? What would be the right reaction in that situation? As long as the hospitalizations are not going up, as long as people are not getting ill, we just carry on. Just keep everything open, keep the schools open, keep the workplace open. Obviously, pubs, shops, restaurants, normal life goes on. Uh, and you know, every, every week or two, we're adding to it. We're adding the risk. I mean, the, probably the last thing to go is spectator sports and things like opera. I mean, it's just because you're generating aerosol when people sing and you've got a crowd in front of you. Similarly, if you play at Wembley, a football match with a crowd, you're generating a lot of people shouting, standing up and, and so on. And you can't get away from that. You can hardly ask the audience to shut up. You know, so no <laughs> shouting. You've got to wear a, a plaster around your mouth mm. for the whole of the match. So, uh, so we have this ridiculous vision of football when you've got artificial applause. I mean, yeah. it's absolutely yeah. ridiculous to, what, to watch and listen to. So uh, and sometimes it gets out of sync with where the ball is. That's the, the strangest <laughs> thing. But... but I think moving forward, uh, what will happen is that society has already got used to it. People of all ages have got used to it. There's an extreme with older people. A lot of people are frightened. Um, That's partly the government's fault. They frightened them right at the beginning Mm. with this protect the NHS, which was unnecessary. Uh, And that means they're too frightened still to go back to normal society. And we've got to get back to normal. And... uh, but again, you get the gloom and doom merchants. I mean, you see them everywhere. Good Morning Britain and you know, ITV morning television, daytime television. I've been on a couple of times now. And their resident doctor, he's always predicting in two weeks there'll be the second wave. He said that a month ago. And luckily, it's not. So. But let's say that there is and there yes. are more hospitalizations and we start to see that coming back. What should the government do in that situation? Okay, so... That would be the doomsday scenario. Yes. Which, if hospitalizations go up, ICU admissions go up, 85,000 deaths happen, just like the gloomy epidemiologist prediction. 
we would have to take action. Now, can we do it without lockdown? That's the question. Can we just blast away? Sweden did it without any lockdown. Well, it's not true they did it without lockdown. They did it with social distancing and they did it with uh, hand washing and all those. And Sweden is a very, di very disciplined country. I mean, it's, uh, the whole of Scandinavia is very disciplined. Uh, we're not so disciplined. We're, we're freer spirits, I guess. Mm. Uh, uh, we're more uh, revolting against uh, 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 the sort of things we've been talking about. We don't like it. And so uh, imagine if you really locked down this part of London and put the roadblocks up. You'd object. I mean, you can't get out of your flat. You can't leave your studio. This would be terrible. So uh, I think what will happen if we do get a lot of hospitalizations, there will be a sort of balance. It will never be as bad as it was in April, March, April. But we may see some. Now, the other thing we may see is local, more serious local lockdown. What's curious, the Leicester, which is well, been, well studied now, not a blip in hospital admissions in Leicester. So you can see the classic dome-shaped curve for infection in Leicester going up and going right down again now. And look at the hospital admission just flat throughout the whole thing. So totally different if you look at Leicester way back in, in, in March and April when the, the admissions went up and the numbers went up. So something different happening. So I, I think it's a hypothetical question, as you say, Constantine, but it's likely uh, that it's not going to happen. But if it did happen, we'd have to reconsider the strategy. I mean, policies would have to look at how they could do some sort of local shift in, in policy. And Carol, I know that you are not a psychiatrist, um, but I, I do want to talk about. Give I did half a day. Yeah, yeah. Half a day. Yeah. <laughs> she wants some personal help. Yeah, I do. I'm a comedian. We're all unhinged yeah. uh, to one degree or another. But we don't seem to be talking about mental health enough when it when it comes to the lockdown. I feel yeah. and the impact it has had on people and the uh, the public as a whole. I read a stat that apparently, according to the National Office of Statistics that depression has more than doubled. What, it, it, well, one of the problems with mental health, and you know, we do ridiculously small amounts when you're a medical student, and then you forget it until something happens, or you've got a mad patient and you're stuck trying to work out what to do. Uh, the problem with mental health, it's so difficult to measure the severity. So um, depression is a great example. Someone comes in, I'm depressed, doctor. So what do I do? Um, how do I measure how serious this person is? Or someone says, I want to kill myself. So you get into the suicide conversation. So how can you assess, is it serious? I remember there was a lady about, when I was a young doctor, I did general practice for several weekends, and I'd go out, and there was a lady about to jump off a build from the, the, the high ledge on a, uh, above a pub in Whitehall, the, the, the White Cross, the Silver Cross, the Silver Cross in White. And I phoned up 999 because you know, I couldn't handle it myself. And they said, well, how serious is it? I said, well, like, she's sitting <laughs> on the ledge. Said, well, <laughs> you know, I've been called as a doctor and we need to get help. We need to get an ambulance and probably the fire brigade here. So, but it's very difficult to assess how serious. So when you say depression has gone up, if you ask people, how do you feel today? And you give them a scale, often mm. a linear analog scale, mark here, or number of smiles on a, mm. on a thing. So there's the number of smiles, lots of smiles, you're not depressed, or the other way around. Lots of sad faces, you're depressed. Lots of happy faces, you're not depressed. Um, it's a very crude measurement of, of the reality of depression. But I think very good indicators of suicide rate going up. That's pretty extreme child abuse going up, because it is a form of mental aberration, if you like. It's not normal for family to, 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 to beat children up or to harm children. Uh, and then uh, the other thing is how many people actually got admitted to mental institutions, section, the compulsory detention, are much fewer. And the reason for that, of course, is the whole system is broken and people didn't weren't called, psychiatrists weren't called, psych psychosocial workers weren't, uh, psychiatric social workers weren't called to, to go and section people. So again, when this is all over, uh, probably not till September, uh, it may not be over. Well, we're in September now, <laughs> yeah. aren't we? We are, you're right, yeah. I was forgetting, we've moved on. But when, when I say when it's over, when we can actually collect all the data, yeah. just like cancer, mm. you can look at mental health of the nation and look through it. And what will be fascinating 
is to compare it with other countries, to start looking at the same thing in other countries who've handled it differently, the timing's been different, the, the enforcement's been different. And, you know, I have a granddaughter that lives in Peru, and that's a military police state. It's strictly enforced. You can't go out without a permit and that sort of thing. And people stop you. And you get fined if you do. And, and so we've never had that here. And that generates its own mental health problems. Mm. Essentially, feeling locked up for six months is not a, a good feeling. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, so that's, all the, that's the problem with mental health. And there's also a question that we talk about stats and data. We talk about excess deaths. But then it, it came to the fore that actually the, the data that has been used by everybody isn't even reliable. I think the worst one's been the deaths, you know. Um, Public Health England, which has met its own demise over this whole issue, it was only pointed out two months ago that, that the death figures were greatly exaggerated. And it was a simple error. And what they were doing, if you've been tested positive, you were flagged up on one register mm. uh, as positive. And then if you died and the computer matched the two, if, wherever you've had your test in positive, you were called a COVID death. So if you walked out of the hospital having been tested positive, got hit by a bus, you died from COVID. If you died of, of, of terminal cancer, uh, you died with an axe in your head because your wife didn't like you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you, Talking about you, my future there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you got all these things. And, and so the number, of, it was ridiculous. And so then they tried to say, well, let's do it 60 days after testing positive. And then, so there was the 60-day death. And then they made it 28 days, which is much more realistic. Mm. If you've been tested positive, you die within 28 days. It doesn't get you out from being run over by a mm. bus, but it's less likely. It's more likely to be COVID than other things. But none of it was based. And no one understood that it, even the health minister didn't understand that when he was quoting these deaths, they weren't based on the reality. And at one point, uh, four weeks ago, they had to change the number downwards. It was embarrassing. It was appeared on the WHO website. And it said Britain, 46,000 uh, a week ago, and now only 41,000 deaths. <laughs> so where have the, the 5,000 gone? Well, they were wrongly attributed to COVID. That was the little byline there. So measurement is key because if we are going to make comparisons, France, Germany, Switzerland, uh, Sweden, and us, we need to make sure we're comparing apples with apples and not apples and oranges. So we've got to get these numbers. The same with the infection rate. We've got to make sure we're comparing the same thing. And, you know, if you go and collect people in London where the infection rate is probably about one in 60,000 of us has it. So you'd, be, you'd never find someone, one in 60,000. The chance of you finding someone this afternoon down the commercial road that has COVID is almost zilch. Mm -hmm. Um, but if we go to an area where you know there's a lot of people that are positive just in the last few days, then you're much more likely to find it. There may be one in every 20 people has got COVID. So put no swabs up, collect saliva, you'll find it. So it's a, it, it can bias the numbers in a, whichever way you want to. So looking at everything that's happened, there's been mistakes made, there's been good decisions made. What do you think should be the lessons learned that we have so far from this whole yeah. episode? I think the first lesson is to strengthen public health communication. Yeah. I, you know, I had no idea as a, as a consultant that this was really going on till about February, and I thought it would just blow away. I mean, I, I couldn't believe what happened in the end. Uh, and, and so we've got to prepare for the same thing happening again in exactly the same way. And we've got to prepare for it in a way that doesn't involve lockdown. Can we do it without locking mm. down all services and including health services? Can we do it in a way that maintains the emergency function for uh, an infection without closing down the system? Uh, the second thing is, is much better public education about what to do. And, uh, and the, the third thing is the politicians probably should stay out of it. I mean, it was dominated by the Boris show, you know, these th Boris or uh, some other deputy of Boris is standing there in the center, flanked by his undertakers, uh, uh, Chris Whitty and, and uh, the chief scientists often, 
in dressed in, in black suits and black ties as though they're the executioners <laughs> of the country. And I think it's not a political thing. It's a, it just you needs one guy to take control of it and say, this is the spokesman for the medical profession, like Anthony Fauci did in the States, although him and Trump are just bizarre to watch because Trump is a bizarre character. But uh, I think I think that's the way forward. And, uh, you know, the health service really should have kept going for everything else throughout the whole thing. And, uh, you know, and then you get things like nightingales, which were based on the gloomy predictions of the epidemiologists and proved to be a complete waste of time. Oh, sure, 40 patients were admitted to the one in East, well, near here in Excel, but that was just tokenism to show it could be done. And even that project wasn't thought through because where you're going to get the staff from, you're going to have to take them from existing hospital. You're not going to recruit staff in the time frame to suddenly open it. Um, staff are the limiting factor in healthcare. It's uh, always been so and always will. So a question that a lot of ordinary people will be asking is, when do we get back to normal? And I don't mean new normal. I mean normal, where we meet, we shake hands, we don't wear you know, yeah. mask to go to a supermarket and then you walk out of the supermarket, go into a pub and you're fine to sit with people. Like all of these <laughs> things that don't make any sense. Right? No. When do we get back to actual normal? My prediction is 1st of January, we'd be back to normal when you can get rid of everything. No social distancing, all those silly signs everywhere and you go on the tr London transport. I mean, they put a lot of effort into it. You know, they've had to. But it, you know, I think it's an overreaction. Uh, you know, if the virus is on that tube, it's going to get you with your two meters or five meters. It's, as the tube's crowded, you're going to get the virus if it's there. Uh, so I think January is the time to new year, new vision, new normal. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds it sounds great. But what would do you think we need to see in terms of the data? Yeah, to facilitate because putting a date on it is sort of a little know, arbitrary, isn't it? I Whereas I think it, it, I guess a more interesting way of looking at it might be what needs to happen with the virus in order for us to feel comfortable doing that. Obviously, number one would be a vaccine. Yeah, if we get that, that sort of takes care of it. Yeah, is that broadly accurate? Mm -hmm. and we, uh, go for flu. it. I mean, vaccine is not necessarily the answer because first of all, it may take longer than we think. Yeah. It's got to be completely safe before any of the regulators will allow it. Otherwise, they'll be pummeled if it causes mm. some bizarre neurological degenerative syndrome, for example. That doesn't sound good. No, no but just, they get caught. <laughs> <this part. laughs> exactly. This is one of the complications of viruses, of, of vaccines, if, especially if they're not fully tested. Mm. Uh, but more importantly, it's not work for the flu, really and it's not worked for, for SARS, so it may not work for this. In a way, that we hope that we, it'll have partial immunity, or it'll help, but it may not be the only solution. And the, the effort to vaccinate millions of people is, is quite significant. Yeah. Right there. But uh, I think by January, we'll be in a much better place. As long as the hospitalizations stay down, we can experiment. We can start removing things like the, the, the masks and like the, mm. the, the social distancing. But hand washing is not a bad idea. The shaking hands, if you wash your hands, then it's fine, you know. Mm. It's, uh, I think we'll get back to normal quicker than we think, and people will stop being scared. What I find amazing is children. Uh, mm. I've got six grandchildren. Mm. I look at them and talk to them. They're not frightened about it. They're, they're fine. Well, they're pretty much immune. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so they've got no reason to be yeah. frightened. But some of them have been locked up, you know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and so, uh, but they they have a better understanding. Because children are much more adaptable than we are. Yeah. Mm. In wartime, children just went through it with bombs going off and no problem. I mean, some of them had psychological scars, but they tolerated it. And people from war zone, children are down mm. to it all. Yeah. Whereas, uh, yeah. And what do you, what do you think about? Uh, the New Zealand's position in that they've taken extreme lockdowns. The moment we got, they got four cases. I think it was everything shut, literally everything. France has been wanting to close the borders for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but no, do, do, you, do you agree with that, that, that approach to it? Or do you see it as being a huge overreaction? It, I think that's a huge overreaction. I mean, they, 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 they're now getting cases because cases are coming. And, and that's the problem. Uh, I haven't looked at the New Zealand Philippines for the last two weeks, but I, I gather that they're, they're bouncing back a bit because they, they get people coming, uh, whether they're legal or not legal, they come and the figures start going up. Um, the countries that 
if you if you look at the the countries of the world, they've all had slightly different strategies. But the trouble is, how firm was the policy of not admitting people from abroad? You, because returning residents have always been allowed back. So if you're a New Zealander and you come back from somewhere, you're allowed in. And that may be, and you may have to quarantine, but how effective is that quarantine? If you want to do it properly, you've got to take people straight off the plane into a camp. Rather like the people, remember the pictures at the very beginning of all this, of people coming from, um, where were they coming from now? They were coming from Wuhan, they were mm. coming from China, and they were bussed from Bryce Norton to the, the Milton Keynes, to accommodation in Milton Keynes, and kept there for two weeks. And that was before they had any compulsory detention uh, laws. Uh, and that was the first we saw of it. Seemed like years ago, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. So, uh, so how firm your quarantine is, how firm your policing of the border, and if you allow residents in, who knows what's going to happen? And that's what's probably happened in New Zealand. Because it's also as well is that we don't know that how long the virus has been here. So, for instance, I, I was still a teacher in in the, uh, December time, and I remember around about January, this there was a thread on Twitter with assistant heads and head teachers talking about having COVID-like symptoms. And we, we discussed ourselves about, I yeah. think I had it in mid-February. I had all the symptoms. There was a case in France in December, Yeah, wasn't there? I, there were the cases in France. There was even cases in November in, at a shooting party in Worcestershire, believe it or not. Really? In Worcester, Wiltshire, Wiltshire. Yeah. And uh, uh, there were three cases out of six people that stayed in a, a big country house and the, they proven positive. I mean, how it all arose and how it spread, the most likely scenario, it arose in Wuhan somehow, whether it was... Uh, Do you have any unorthodox thoughts on the origins of the virus? The, the, yeah, you mean it was an escape from the laboratory? The, yeah. yeah. It was a weaponized virus. It was a research program to weaponize the virus. It escaped probably accidentally because viruses do escape. People break the safety rules, mm. and don't wear gloves or don't wear whatever you need to wear. And uh, the virus got out. And then, it, you know, I like to think it's, it's a luxury virus. It went straight down the airport road to the first class lounge <laughs> and then went, book me first class around the world. All its little friends, all yeah. its little viruses said goodbye with their little suitcases and went off. And they went first class because they could meet fat people, they could meet rich people, they could meet people that were old because older people can travel because they have more money than the young, and they shifted it. And before we finish, the one thing I'd really like to say, because it reminds me of that, that one of the economic consequences that the mainstream media don't bring out is this business of generational theft, which has now been increased. So generational theft comes, people my age, had free education completely. My kids had free, more or less free. I think I just caught the thousand pound fee a year for mm. university education for the, the youngest. Uh, then we've had house prices that every time, my first house cost 12,000 pounds. Imagine that. Now. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> and you, know, you sell it for 60,000 pounds, then you get the next one for yeah. 70,000, yeah. then you sell that for, you know, say, 200, yeah. and then yeah. on it goes. And so it goes, and it goes on up. So all my generation to a different, and we've had end, end, end scheme pensions, mm. and the final year pensions, uh, whereas your generation is not going to have that. It's not possible. So what happens with COVID, of course, it disproportionately affects the younger people whose education has been stopped, younger than you, education has been abruptly stopped, and there are just going to be no jobs to get started. So all those graduates that are out there, a lot of them are not going to, they were promised internships. They may get their internship because it's free. They may get the, the, the SUNAC scholarships or whatever they call it from government, but they're not going to have a proper job. The same so way. with that in mind then, before we ask our last question, should we have done and should we in the future in a similar situation shield the vulnerable, shield the elderly, and allow the rest of society to get on with their yeah. lives as normal? Is that the right solution here? That, that seems a good solution. I, I think you've got to give a free choice to people. You know, this, it's educational messages. If you're over 70, consider your health. For example, are you, if you're a fit, active 70 year old, just be, carry about your business. But remember, you are at greater risk than if you were 50. And that it's up to you what you decide to do, not to try and enforce it. Not to say every, if a you know, 70 year old is on the street and shoot at sight, 
shoot to kill. <laughs> ID, sir, out, boom. Yeah. Uh, and that's the, the way forward. Uh, uh, and and that, that protects them, and so the others can act, whatever, do whatever they want, because they're not likely to be seriously damaged. So if, if a young person's on chemotherapy, for example, for cancer, then they should be prepared to protect themselves by isolating from the rest. But it's mainly about avoiding crowds where you don't control your meeting. So going to a shop is you have no control on social distance, whereas in your garden you have perfect control on social distance. And thank you so much for coming on the show. It's proved incredibly enlightening. Uh, the last question we always finish with is, uh, what is the one thing we're not talking about as a society that we really should be? So we're not talking about death. And... Uh, Western society never talks about death. And it, it's become even more difficult with the demise of religion, of organized religion. So organized religion, Church of England, whatever, <coughs> not just Christianity, but all the religions. Um, at the moment, we sort of blank it out of our lives. There is no end to it. We're going to go on forever. We, we're eternal beings. And I think that's what we've seen with this. That, you know, I, I've got a Twitter account, as you know. And if I mention death, it's like a whole load of bees suddenly come for me mm. saying you're being uh, unpleasant mentioning death. And uh, I guess doctors are closer to death than most people. And if you're a cancer doctor, a lot of your patients are going to die. And uh, you have to accept it. But I think we don't talk about it in a meaningful way. And uh, we don't accept it. And I, I think it, it's become a failure. It's a failure for the medical establishment if someone dies. It's a failure for the politicians if the death rate goes up. And I think it's really reflected in the conversation we've had. If the average age of death is 82 for a COVID person, then uh, that is actually very close to the average age of death in the UK anyway, which is 82.3. So you're not actually taking life away. But look at what we have taken away from people. So maybe the balance of death is not too bad a thing. I mean, it's... Now, the problem is, you get, the argument is, well, oh, Carol, you're being harsh because, you know, there have been 40-year-old people in their prime with no comorbidities that have also died. Well, that's the nature of things. If you cross a road, a certain proportion of people will get flattened by the bus coming by. That's always going to happen. You don't close the road because it will stop the buses traveling. So uh, it's getting a balance of risk in there. But death has got to become an acceptable outcome for people. It is in hospices. That's the only place it is. Uh, it's not in, in out there in society. That's such a good point. I'm glad you make that point because I feel like on a lot of the response to this virus, the thinking has been very one-dimensional, very one-dimensional. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll save lives, as, as the slogan was, but how many lives are now affected by the, the other things? And I, I'm, I'm really glad we've had a chance to discuss that with you. Uh, Professor Sikora, thank you so much for coming on. If people want to follow uh, your commentary, the things that you're putting, uh, where do they go to find that? Prof. Carol Sikora on Twitter, uh, and two or three a day is about the most I can make. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for coming on, right. and thank you for watching. We will see you very soon with another live stream or episode, and they all go out at 7 p.m. UK time. Take care, and see you soon, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching guys. As always, subscribe to the YouTube channel, click the bell button next to the subscribe button so you get notified when a video comes out and follow us on all the social media at TriggerPod. And also leave us a nice review on iTunes and spread.